end of the sermon. Trust that everyone has it. What about God reads like this? Now I make known to you, brother, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas or Peter then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me. I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach. And so you believe. I want to preach this morning from the subject, the certainty of the resurrection. You may have your seats. Thank you very much, ushers. You are too kind. The certainty of the resurrection. I promise you I won't be long. I'm not getting a good vibe at all. The certainty of the resurrection. Lord have mercy. I preached this text approximately two years ago in my youthfulness. I was able to glean whatever it was I was able to glean. As the older preachers would say, I got a few miles on me now. <laughs> I could go back two years ago and tell that 23 year old me, boy, you ain't know what you was talking about. <laughs> I want to preach this morning from the subject, the certainty of the resurrection. Hear me, 22 years after President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. His body, his coffin had to be exhumed. His coffin had to be exhumed because there were reports that went out that suggested that President Abraham Lincoln's body was no longer in the grave. Because of the reports that Abraham Lincoln's body was no longer in the grave, a team of forensic scientists were gathered to go down to the grave site where President Abraham Lincoln's body had been buried to verify, to solidify, to prove that President Abraham Lincoln, who had been assassinated, was still in the grave. After this team of forensic scientists had verified that President Abraham Lincoln's body was still in the grave, the reports that said his body was no longer in the grave quickly diminished. But apparently everybody did not believe that President Abraham Lincoln's body was still in the grave. So 14 years after the 22 years, there were more reports that went out that said President Abraham Lincoln's body is not in the grave. All right. And in response to these new reports, a new team of forensic scientists were gathered together 
there are people who make the notion that somehow after two instances in which it has been proven that President Abraham Lincoln is dead and is still dead, there are people even today who suggest that President Abraham Lincoln's body is not in the grave. I don't expect this to surprise you because in a similar instance, three days after the Lord Jesus Christ had been crucified, there were reports that went out throughout all of Jerusalem that Jesus Christ's body was not in the grave. After the reports went out, there were very many witnesses gathered together on that Sunday morning. First, Mary Magdalene and her crew went down and there was the two angels who said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Yep, yep, yep. And when Mary Magdalene and her crew received the message from the angels, they in turn went back to the disciples and Peter, the Bible says, ran down to the tomb only to find out that Jesus Christ was not in the grave. No, he was not in the grave. And it was this that made Peter and all the apostles and Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus and all the other women that were with her, it was this that made them believe and know for a certainty that Christ had resurrected from the dead. But I hear what you're saying, brother, reverend, pastor, preacher. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there to see the empty tomb. Peter was there to see the empty tomb. All those women that were with Mary, they were there to see the empty tomb. But my question to you is, how do you know that Jesus was resurrected from the dead? I ain't just asking me, I'm asking you. How do you know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead? Here, in our selected text, the Holy Spirit makes known to us how it is that both you and I know for a certainty that the Lord Jesus Christ is not a dead Jesus, but he is a risen saint. First, we know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, hear me, because we are being delivered from sin. Okay, let's go back through it one more time. We know that Jesus Christ was, was resurrected from the dead because both you and I are being delivered from sin. In verses 1 and 2, Paul reminds us that freedom from sin is the result of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, y'all, they would be. Paul, in verses 1 and 2, reminds us that freedom from sin is the result of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me say it another way. If your testimony is, I'm not what I used to be. If your testimony is, I'm not what I ought to be, but I'm glad I'm not what I used to be, it's because you having a changed life is the result of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If your life has been affected by the gospel, it's because Jesus Christ has resurrected from the dead. We know that Christ has resurrected from the dead because there has been a change within us. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Paul opens his argument. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 
Number one, by using the temporal connecting word now. Paul's use of the temporal connecting word now is simply to say that I am no longer talking about what it was I was talking about, but I am now talking about what I am talking about. And what Paul is talking about in these 11 verses is the resurrection, the certainty of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, now I will make known to you. Some of your translations might say, remind you. Paul is re-establishing what he has already preached before. In my youthfulness, when I read that two years ago, I said something like, we know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead because the gospel has not changed. That's a good reason. We know that Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead because the gospel is the same gospel today as it was yesterday. And the gospel will be the same tomorrow as it is today. We know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead because the gospel does not change. But that is a very minor point to Paul's overall point here. Paul says, now I will make known to you, I will remind you what I have told you before. That the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and which also you stand, by which also you are saved. Note there, the key word of verses 1 and 2 is saved. I will remind you of the gospel that saved you in the first place. I'm going to tell you what made a difference in your life in the first place. I'm going to tell you the same thing over and over and over again. Because without it, you are hopeless. Paul says, I'm going to preach to you the gospel which I preached to you before, by which also you are saved. Paul's reference to the gospel here is simply a reference to the good news about the salvation both you and I have received because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says the gospel that I preach to you, the salvation that we have received in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what you were saved by. Take note of the word saved here in the text. The word saved here comes from the Greek word sozo. It literally means to be delivered from the bondage of sin. It means to be, to be set free from the penalty of sin. Paul says, the gospel that I preach to you set you free from wrongdoing. All right. We know that Jesus Christ has resurrected from the dead because we are set free free from doing what is wrong. Okay, I, I, I need you to hear that. We know that Christ has been resurrected from the dead because we are no longer chained to sin. But it's because of Christ's resurrection that the chains that bound us to sin have been broken and now we are free to live godly in a sinless world. Now, if you have not accepted the gospel, then you have no power to live a sinless life in a sinful world. But if you have accepted the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that pushes you to do right when your nature wants you to do wrong. 
The presence of the indwelling uh, of the Holy Spirit is the result of a resurrected Savior. For the Bible says that Jesus told his disciples, I will go away, but don't you worry about it. I'm going to send you a helper, but I cannot send you the helper until I take my rightful seat on the right hand side of God. And in able, in order for Jesus to take his seat on the right hand side of God, he had to be resurrected from the dead. So now that I have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and my life is being changed, I know that Christ got up from the dead. Paul says, by which you are being saved. But don't just note the definition of saved. Note the grammatical features surrounding the text. The word saved is a verb used in the present tense. Bad translation here, it has used in the past tense. The Greek, saved, I like the NIV here, it says you are being saved. The verb used in the present tense shows continuous action. Watch Paul, because Paul generally uses salvation in three different ways. Paul speaks about the salvation we have received. The, Paul speaks about the salvation we will receive. But here, 1 Corinthians 7, 15, verse 2, Paul is not talking about past salvation, neither is he talking about future salvation, but he is talking about current salvation. Paul says, you are being saved. No, this shouldn't confuse you. Theologically speaking, past salvation speaks about justification. Future salvation speaks about glorification. Present salvation speaks about sanctification. Paul says you are being sanctified. You are being made right with God. Your life should be changing as a result of the resurrected Christ. This is why when Christian folk display bad, rude, obnoxious behavior, the world denies the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because the world will accept the resurrection of Jesus Christ if Christians lived like Christ got up from the dead. Paul says you are being sanctified by the gospel I preach to you. We are being delivered from sin. This is how we know that Christ was resurrected from the dead. You are being saved. Notice the condition here in the text. If you hold on or hold fast to the gospel that I preach to you, you are being saved if you continue in what I told you in the first place. Don't confuse this. This is not relevant to a once saved, always saved doctrine. Neither is this relevant to a person can lose their salvation doctrine. Don't use it for that. Paul simply says, if you keep the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is what saved you. But at any time that you take away from what I told you, you were never saved in the first place. I could really play around with that but I'm trying to let you go to eat barbecue. And that's no pulpit excuse for poor exposition, that's just the truth. Paul says that we are being delivered from sin as a result of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I thought I'd have a witness there, glad I brought home. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number five, somewhere around verse 17, that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Newness of life is the proof that Christ is not in the grave. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. 
We know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead because we are being delivered from Satan. Not only do we know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the, from the dead because we are being delivered from sin, but we know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead because credible witnesses saw the risen Christ. Verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 speak about what we have received from eyewitnesses. Particularly verses 3 and 4 remind us of what the message of salvation contains. Paul says, I'm going to remind you of what I preached to you before. And verses 3 and 4 tells us what Paul preached before. Paul says, for I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. The message of salvation essentially contains two things. First, it contains the purpose of why Christ was crucified. And second, it contains the benefit of Christ's resurrection. Christ was not crucified just because, but he was crucified for a purpose. He was crucified for a purpose. And he was resurrected for a benefit. Note the purpose for which Christ was crucified. He was crucified, text says, for our sins. He was not crucified because he was a sinner. He was crucified because you and I are sinners. Paul says he was crucified for our sins. Paul notes that I'm not just making this up, but it's according to the scriptures. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, He, a reference to Christ, was wounded for our transgressions. He, another reference to Christ, was bruised for our iniquities. He, another reference to Christ, was the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, both you and I are healed. We needed a sin offering because a, a lamb or a goat just wouldn't do. And when we couldn't supply our own sin offering that was acceptable to God, God was gracious enough to send a sin offering and saved us the, the trouble of crucifying us. God provided the offering and God made sure the offering was crucified for you and I. We know that Christ was resurrected from the dead because Credible witnesses saw the risen Christ. Not only is there a purpose in the crucifixion of Christ, there's a benefit in the resurrection of Christ. Paul says, Christ was crucified for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried proof that he died and that the, in accordance to the scriptures, and he rose on the third day in accordance with the scripture. There's some confusion here, allow me to be technical for a moment, about how the three days were calculated. This doesn't seem right for Christ to be crucified on a Friday and raised, and be raised three days later on a Sunday. That's not three days, that's two days. Know that in the Jewish culture, days were counted by when you could no longer see the sun, Come on now. and then when you could see the sun rise. 
So they counted days, not in as you and I count days in a 24 hour period, but they counted days in accordance to when the sun went down and when the sun came up. As far as they was concerned, when you could no longer see the sun, the day was over. And when you could see the sun, the day had just got started. Are you with me? But the Jews were under the oppression of the Romans and the Romans did not use a Jewish calendar. Here, Paul is counting according to Jewish time, not Roman time. In Roman time, it would be two days. In Jewish time, it would be three days. That means absolutely nothing when Paul uses the phrase third day. He's simply referring to the fact that it was Sunday. Come on now. It's a distinction from Saturday, which was the Sabbath day for Jews. Paul says, Christ was risen on the third day according to the scriptures. Some theologians believe that this is not only a reference to Sunday, but they also believe that this is a reference to what the psalmist said when he said that Jesus would be resurrected before his body could see corruption. A body would start to corrode after three days. The Bible says that Jesus rose on the third day, which means Jesus rose before his body could see corruption. Paul says Jesus was resurrected on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The benefit of the resurrection is that both you and I can receive the presence of the Holy Spirit. We can receive the presence of the Holy Spirit because Jesus promised to send us a helper when he got up. Here's the problem. You wasn't there to see him get up, were you? Nope. <laughs> Neither was I there to see him get up. But aren't you glad that we don't have to be there? We just need to have a credible witness to tell us that he was no longer there. Paul gives us a few. I won't bore you with going through all of these people that Paul mentions here, but suffice it to say that they are credible witnesses. Paul says the first person to see him was Peter. The next people to see him were the 12 disciples. More than 500 people saw him at one time, and then he appeared to all of the 12. But if you don't know none of them, Paul says he appeared to me. <laughs> Listen, you, you need a witness to verify your statements. In the time that Paul wrote this text, an eyewitness was among the, the most credible witness. Your statement was not just good enough, but you could win the case if you had somebody else to validate your story. Paul says, I'm not the only person that told you that he got up. Peter told you he got up. The more than 500 people will tell you that he got up. He was not there. Credible witnesses. Paul uses the same word in all four verses. Note it. Verses 5, 6, seven and eight, Paul uses the same word, appeared. He appeared. He appeared. He appeared. This has very interesting cultural and historical significance because it was not unforeign for a person to dream about somebody who had died. Hear me. It was not unforeign for a person to hallucinate about somebody who had died, but it wasn't, it was foreign for multiple people to have the same experience. All right. So when Paul is talking to these people who are Greek philosophers or Greek minded, they understand the word appear to mean that they had a dream about Christ. But Paul makes it clear that this was no dream. All right. When Paul uses the word appear, the Greek word that he uses means to physically see. Yeah. It, it means to be something that is tangible, something that can be touched. Paul says these were not hallucinations. This was not in a 
imaginative image. This was a physical person. Yes, Paul says Christ appeared. Yeah. You don't believe me? Here are some credible witnesses that you can ask. Yes. I got a question for you. Are you a credible witness? Come on, come on now. When people want to know more about the Lord Jesus Christ, can they come to you? Or do you run them away because they see no change in your life? Are you a credible witness that Christ rose from the dead and he has made a change in my life? Are you a credible witness? The other day, went to Walmart to buy some groceries, put all my stuff in the basket. I went through the line, paid for my merchandise, and when the payment went through, thank God, I got a receipt. Stay with me. I put my receipt in my pocket. I pushed my buggy to the exit door. But there was somebody standing there. And she said, excuse me, sir. Did you just pay for these groceries? And I looked at her with both of my hands on the buggy. And I said, yes, ma'am, I just paid for these groceries. I went to push my buggy out the door. She said, uh-uh, sir. Do you have a receipt? <laughs> Y'all missed it. My word wasn't good enough. She wouldn't accept the fact that I told her that I had paid for my groceries, but to prove that I had paid for my groceries, she needed to see something to verify that I was telling the truth. Real sense, ladies and gentlemen, that is all Paul is doing here in the text. He gives this myriad of witnesses to say, if you don't believe me, you can ask them. And if you don't believe them, you can ask them. And if you don't believe them, you can ask them. And if you run out of people to ask, just go and ask me. <laughs> Are you credible? Can somebody ask? Not only do we know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead because we are being delivered from sin, and not only do we know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead because credible witnesses saw the risen Christ, but lastly we know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead because we are recipients of God's grace. Yes, God. Yes, God. Verses 9, 10, and 11, Paul explains the kindness that we have received as a result of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me rush. In verses 9, 10, and 11, essentially Paul talks about the grace he received to be a messenger of God. But don't limit Paul's statements just to the grace that he received as much as Paul as saying that we are all recipients of the grace that God has shown to me. God called Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles. But the grace that Paul had received, he had shared it with the people that God called him to lead. And as a result, everybody was a recipient of the same grace. Paul says, verse number nine, for I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. I love this, but 
that he is what he is because Christ is no longer in the grave. Paul says, if Christ was still in the grave, I would never have received the grace of God. But since I have received the grace of God, it is proof enough that Christ is no longer in the grave. I am what I am by the grace of God. His grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which is with me. Grace of God simply refers to the kindness that God has shown each of us. I like to say often, you have not always had what you have. You have not always been where you are right now. But it's nothing but the grace of God. The all sinners in desperate need of a sin. The Bible says he did, says there is no sin in him, is a liar in the truth. It's not evil. The all sinners and we need God's grace. In Acts chapter 9, Luke records how Paul received the grace of God. Paul was a persecutor of the church, as he states here, going to and fro to bring Christians into prison. But Christ himself appeared to Paul on the road at Damascus. Christ came into his life and he did not change where Paul was going, but he changed the intent that Paul had when he got there. I, I think y'all are missing this. We have a habit of saying that God picked me up and turned me around in order for me to go the opposite direction. Mm -mm. God saves us to continue to go where we were going, we just have different intentions when we get there. <laughs> As opposed to where we had bad intentions, our intentions have now changed. We used to go places to talk about people, now we go places to talk about Christ. We still live, it's just our intentions have changed. Paul received the grace of God. Paul shared that grace with the Corinthians. They believed the message that Paul preached to them, and they were all recipients of the same grace. Hear this. Two friends had received their test results back. One had a 94. The other one had a 92. They got into an argument about who was smarter than the other. I'm smarter than you. I got a 94. You got a 92. Just outside the classroom door, they were getting kind of loud. The teacher walked out and said, what's the problem? One of the friends explained that we are arguing because I'm trying to get him to understand that I am obviously smarter than him. The teacher said, wait a minute, let me explain something to you. Both of you failed the test. <laughs> Both of you failed the test. But what happened was, I graded on a curve. So because of the curve, you both end up passing the test. But before you both pass the test, you both have failed the test. But if it had not been for the grace that I showed, then both of you would still be failing. Let me talk to you. Paul essentially is trying to say that some of you are discrediting my apostleship because I am the least of the apostles. But Paul says it doesn't matter if the least of the apostles tells you that Jesus died and was resurrected from the dead, or it doesn't matter if the greatest apostle told you that Jesus died and was resurrected from the dead. The fact of the matter is, the message is the same. And we are recipients of God's grace. I held you long enough, I've been my seat. But all I've been 
I'm trying to tell you in this short time we spend together is that we know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead because we are being delivered from sin. We know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead because credible witnesses saw the risen Christ. Lastly, we know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead because we are recipients of his grace. Before I became a student at the College of Biblical Studies, I was a computer engineering student at the University of Houston. As a computer engineering technology student at the University of Houston, I was required to take several mathematical courses. It was in the requirement to take several mathematical courses that I was in introduced to a mathematical concept known as the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle is specifically a applied to quantum mechanics equations that do not have definite solutions. You do know that there are some mathematical problems that do not have a definite solution. But when you come across a mathematical equation that does not have a definite solution, you would apply the uncertainty principle which simply meant that as long as your answer was in the range of answers, you were correct. Okay. <laughs> Luckily, ladies and gentlemen, we don't serve a God who is interested in the uncertainty principle. Come on, man. He always has an answer to our question. He always has a period at the end of the sentence. He doesn't need an uncertainty principle. But if you are uncertain that Christ died and rose from the dead, allow me to reinforce the message of Christ himself. Allow me to reinforce the message of Peter. Allow me to reinforce the message of John. Allow me to reinforce the message of Paul. Whether you believe it or not, Christ did die. Whether you believe it or not, Christ did, or Christ was buried in a borrowed tomb. Whether you believe it or not, the angels proclaimed that he is not here, but he has risen with all power in his hand. If you're not a Bible reader and you don't believe any of that, and I'll tell you who you can ask. You can ask me. You want to know why? Because I was sick. Deep in sin. I was far from the peaceful shore. But the master of the sea, he heard my despairing prayer. Now safe. Safe in mind. We are safe as a result of the fact that Jesus is no longer in the grave. May God bless you. May God keep you. died for your sins and was resurrected three days later. This is a perfect day for you to get to know you.